Good afternoon. My name is uh, Mess P. Sørensen, and uh, together with my colleagues at the Center of Sociological Studies here at the University in Aarhus, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to the first of what we hope will become a long series uh, of lectures under the heading Aarhus Lectures in Sociology. In this series of lectures, we hope to present one lecture per year in the years to come with the very best of contemporary sociology. Today, we open our new series of lectures with one of the most interesting voices uh, within human sociology. Uh, we are honored that Professor Emeritus uh, of Sociology at the University of Leeds, uh, Sigmund Baumann, accepted our invitation to come to Aarhus today. No one better represents the ideals we want to put at center uh, of the Aarhus Lectures of Sociology. Sigmund Baumann has, uh, as I'm sure you all know, written a number of influential books and articles during a very active career within sociology that started at the University of Warsaw in Poland more than 50 years ago. Baumann is the author of more than 50 books and hundreds of articles and book chapters. In his first books, written in Polish in the 1950s and 1960s, he wrote about such topics as the British labor movement, Marxism, class, social stratification, democracy, everyday sociology, etc. Sigmund Bauman left Poland in 1968, and in the beginning of the 1970s, he settled in Leeds, where he still lives. In the 1970s and the first part of the 1980s, he continued to write about the British labor movement, socialism, and class. But he also wrote books on hermeneutics, uh, critical sociology, and the role of intellectuals in society. In the last part of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s, uh, he dealt with the relationship between modernity, bureaucracy, rationality, and social exclusion. Writing, among other things, his most famous book, Modernity and the Holocaust, which came out in 1989. Via his analysis and his critique of modernity, uh, Bauman in the 1990s turned towards postmodernity, investigating, among other things, the opportunities uh, of a postmodern ethics. He later took up uh, subjects such as consumerism, globalization, and politics, always with the analysis of the human condition uh, at the forefront. At the beginning of the new century, uh, he shifted focus towards uh, liquid modernity. Since the year 2000, he has, among other works, written six books uh, with liquid in the title. Liquid modernity, liquid love, liquid life, liquid fear, uh, liquid times, and uh, the latest one is called Culture in a Liquid Modern World. Liquid modernity is also the subject of today's lecture. Uh, a lecture that Bauman has called Liquid Modernity Revisited. And I should say that uh, after Bauman's lecture, we will move directly to questions and a discussion, and that we will end here at the very latest at 4 o'clock. So without further introduction, uh, I'll give the floor to you, Professor Baumann. Thank you for coming to Aarhus. We are honored to have you here, um, and we are looking forward to hearing your lecture. Please give Baumann a warm welcome. Thank you. I am all wired up at the moment, so I don't know whether you hear me or not. I will try to be audible. If you don't hear me, tell me. Uh, I would like to start from reminding myself and you 
uh, telling that uh, it's not my first visit to Aarhus. Uh, the first visit was a long time ago, before I think very many of you were born. <laughs> and uh, uh, since then I, I came here several times. But even if, when I'm not in Aarhus, most of the time, unfortunately, I'm not here, uh, the uh, spiritual ring with the place is very strong because one of the two people of whom I learned whatever I understand, whatever I believe in ethical philosophy was teaching here in Aarhus. I mean, Professor um, Knut Lustrup, uh, who moved here in 1940s uh, from Funen, the little island you probably know, where he was for many years, parish priest. And from there he was called here uh, to this university and uh, being here, when being here, he finished, completed his book about ethical demand, uh, which I very much hope you have read. And even more strongly, I hope uh, that if you haven't read, you will very soon. Uh, ethical demand, which uh, constitutes the basis of my understanding of the plight of um, uh, moral being. And we are all, by decree of Almighty or nature or whatever, we are moral beings by necessity, uh, namely confronting others and needing to develop our own attitude towards them, being aroused by the personality, being uh, seeing the face of the other, and feeling some sort of a unspoken demand to take care of him or her. Um, why I'm mentioning uh, uh, Knut Lustrup, not only because of the personal link and not only because uh, he was the, uh, one of the greatest uh, philosophers of ethics, of morality, um, uh, but uh, also because there is some connection with what I'm going to tell you today. I'm not going to speak about ethical philosophy today, about liquid modernity, but uh, one of the major ideas of uh, Lustrup going against the grain, against the current of uh, dominant in ethical philosophy of modern times, was that uh, the state of uncertainty being underdefined, incomplete, underdetermined, and so on, is contrary to uh, the uh, dominant opinion, the natural habitat of the moral person. We are moral because we live in um, uh, state of uncertainty and, and being not completed, not finished, not arrived there and so on. We are, do, we are like that, not in spite of uncertainty, but thanks to the existential un uncertainty. Which uh, gives us, I think, the right perspective of the condition of the plight which we are all now the plight which I'm calling liquid modernity, which is the very epitome, I think, of the state of permanent uh, uncertainty. When, people, when things are on the move, but we are not quite sure where are they moving, where they don't uh, keep their shape for quite a long time, like all liquids, you just, uh, you know, turn a little bit uh, glass in which you have a liquid called water and it changes its shape immediately right away. Uh, so you can't rely on the uh, long term, on the stability of things. And our uh, con uh, 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 current condition is very much like that. Um, the, uh, I, the concept of liquid modernity I came across um, about 15 years ago, I was struggling then with the, uh, the reservations which I had towards the very fashionable at that moment idea of postmodernity. Postmodernity, which I opposed on two grounds. One ground was that the very term postmodernity suggests that uh, we are on the other side already. Modernity is over and we are aftermath of it. Which was 
obviously, evidently untrue, because we are now modern more than any other generation in history was. Uh, we are uh, uh, compulsively, uh, addictively, obsessively modernizing everything around us, and this is the distinctive feature of being modern, modernizing everything around. We are modernizing even things which we created as the latest cry, latest shout of high-tech uh, uh, modernity uh, 10 years ago. We are already started modernizing it. And that's why the uh, impression of uh, time flow, time flow speeding up, things are aging the moment they are born, are starting to age, and they age in a very uh, brief um, uh, stretch of time. Uh, so postmodernity was, in a sense, a misleading term. We are not postmodern, we are modern. We are absolutely modern. Um, and uh, Francois, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, one of the um, intro, in, persons who introduced actually the concept of postmodernity into our thinking and elaborated very widely on it, uh, even said that in order to be modern, you have to first be postmodern, which of course made a, uh, an absurd statement, but it shows how confusing this concept was. Uh, the second uh, reservation towards postmodernity was the uh, negativity of it. It suggested wrongly, falsely, but nevertheless the only thing it suggested was what we are not any longer. It's a negative statement. We are not any longer modern. We are something different. Uh, but it didn't say how different we are. What is the difference? What is the difference? Some positive statement. What is the, what's new about it? And uh, it seemed to me, and still seems to me, that uh, this distinctive feature of our condition, which differs in us, not from modernity, but from classical, the first uh, initial, original modernity, uh, modernity uh, uh, is precisely the degree of liquidity, degree of liquidity. I am saying degree of liquidity because uh, all modernity was liquid. All modernity specializes in melting the solids, melting the received structures, the received ways, ways of life, and recast, trying to recast them in different moods. Yeah, however, there is a very important difference between the way in which the early modernity was liquidizing in the way in which we are liquidizing. The early modernity liquidized not because it was against solid. On the contrary, what moved, what moved the early uh, modern pioneers, the authors of the modern project, was dissat dissatisfaction with the solidity of the existing solid. They uh, believed that they are not solid enough and that the right order which we are going to build, the modern order, will be distinct from the past by being really, really solid. What does it mean, being really, really solid? solid? Well, what they meant, actually, it will be a perfect society. And as Leon, uh, Leon Battista Alberti, one of the greatest representatives of the Renaissance, told us the state of perfection is a state in which any further change can be only a change to the worse. Which means that once you come to the perfect state, you should stop moving. Over, it's all over. You know, the effort, the suffering, the, um, all the uncertainties of the past are over, and from now on, everything is going to repeat itself over and over again, reproduce itself exactly in the same shape. Uh, which means that liquidizing the received, the inherited, without asking, inherited, inherited forms of life. Uh, was treated as a temporary 
irritant, temporary irritant. Once we strain ourselves, once we do the job, one, once we replace the old solids with the new solids, uh, well, uh, you just enjoy the job well done and, uh, and just live on the profits uh, from uh, uh, that work. It all started, mind you, in 1755. There was the great uh, uh, earthquake first in Lisbon. Lisbon at that time was one of the most uh, prestigious centers of culture and uh, riches and wealth and whatever uh, was the industry of the time in Europe. And suddenly this one of the biggest and uh, uh, most respected centers of Europe was destroyed in a matter of few days, first by earthquake, then uh, the earthquake was followed by uh, fire, which destroyed the uh, city, which emerged unscathed from uh, the soil trembling. And then it all was capped up by uh, what we now would call tsunami. The sea waves uh, just uh, you know, stifled the rest of life which was there. And the great, uh, na great, great names of the time, people like uh, Voltaire, um, uh, Diderot, uh, Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, quarreled. What, what does it mean? What, the lesson, what is the lesson which should be drawn from it? The general opinion was that uh, the world under, well, whether divine or natural management is not working properly. Uh, it uh, hits at random, catastrophes come uh, without warning and uh, they just uh, distribute the um, cracks of the whips uh, without uh, taking into account whether they hit the uh, re righteous people or the evil doers, everybody gets uh, the same fate. That means that uh, the nature is morally blind. And uh, it is not in nature of us human beings to uh, endure this sort of a world which is morally indifferent, blind, and not taking account about, about human purposes, about human ideas, human values. After 1755, uh, we have a dominant uh, idea, ideology, in a sense, of modern society, which demands, demands to make the be behavior of the world uh, very much like uh, behavior of humans guided by moral principles. So there should be some order, some predictability, some uh, reason in uh, how the world uh, is organized. That could be achieved, and it's a balanced statement, you are quite sure, I'm quite sure you are aware of it. It would be done by taking the world over human management, new management, new management will be guided by reason, and uh, being guided by reason, uh, we will bring order to chaos, we will make the world more hospitable to human race as it used to be before. And therefore, the old inherited structures must be dissolved, taken apart, dismantled, and replaced by uh, the, the structures which were designed purposefully um, under dictate of reason. Uh, well, uh, today it is a different story. Different, uh, we are not so much uh, 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 are continuing uh, melting the solids because we uh, like solids to be more solid than they are. On the contrary, the slogan of the day, as you know, is uh, flexibility. Flexibility, in uh, translation into ordinary human language, <coughs> means spinelessness. Uh, you, you are accepting everything. You are not sticking to anything excessively. 
Um, the problem, the task is not so much, not so much uh, um, uh, fixing the future by introducing stable structures which will prevent further <laughs> change, but on the contrary, the, uh, what is uh, with our awareness or simply by default, which is guiding our actions, uh, is the fear of uh, fixing, fear of mortgaging the future, Fe fear of not being able to uh, grasp the new opportunities which uh, the future may bring, simply because we are tied up by previously taken obligations, commitments, um, structures which uh, determine uh, the constraints imposed on our life. That is the difference between liquid modernity and uh, uh, solid modernity. Uh, the, uh, how uh, Richard Sennett, the, one of the uh, most interesting and influential contemporary sociologists, observed uh, today perfectly viable organizations are now gutted just to prove their ongoing viability. In order to prove that you are valid, viable, uh, that uh, your way of doing things should be retained, should be retained, you need to demonstrate that uh, you can simply take yourself apart and replace it with something else. Uh, it's just not only about the way in which big companies are organized, which are uh, today, which are in constant change, in constant making people redundant, restructuring, uh, outsourcing, uh, contracting out, subsidiarizing, all this new uh, world created in latest, uh, in latest uh, decades, one or two decades not previously existing in any language, demonstrate the new uh, spiritual attitude, so to speak, the new world, Weltanschauung, as the Germans would say, uh, of the, the organization. But it's not just the question of the organization. It goes down to uh, the very substance of contemporary individual life. Uh, you know very well that uh, your mastery over your identity today is mostly understood by you, even if you not articulate it and not confess of it in public. I am in control of myself if I can become at will somebody else. And not only you think like that, and you practice it, because uh, whoever is on your Facebook probably has several identities at the same time, depending with whom uh, he or she is corresponding. So uh, the question of being flexible, of being not determined, finally, to uh, keeping your options open, not mortgaging, not mortgaging the future. Now, that is the substance of also uh, of life at the level of what Anthony Giddens calls um, life politics. Life politics, not just the politics of governments, not politics of big companies, but politics of individuals who individually, individually using their own talents, their own skills, their own reason, their own resources, try to uh, 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 shape the course of their own life. On this level, on the individual level, on the level of life of uh, everybody uh, uh, sitting here in this room. That hasn't changed, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, uh, since I uh, committed to this book, Liquid Modernity, I was uh, overwhelmed by doubts. Uh, what is it really, this new uh, way of life, which I tried a moment ago briefly to describe? Is it a uh, new era? which we entered, and from now on, the world is likely to remain like that, or is it just a period of transition? We have lost one kind of idea of order, 
uh, which I call the hard modernity or uh, um, um, hardware modernity, unlike the software modernity which we are living now. But uh, 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 or, or whether it is only a transition from that kind of order to a new one which haven't emerged yet. And the first thing I wanted to tell you is that I came to the conclusion that uh, uh, also, mind you, uh, I'm not uh, swearing that I'm right, it is just temporary settlement, temporary statement, my present view. Uh, uh, but I don't know whether I will be again in uh, Aarhus uh, speaking, but I'm a very old man. But uh, in case I do, I, am not, I can't guarantee that I won't change my mind. Anyway, at the moment, uh, at the mo at the moment uh, my idea is that uh, we live in a period of interregnum. What is interregnum? There was Titus Livius, the, one of the first historians of ancient Rome, who uh, uh, wrote this history of early Rome, partly mythological history, uh, of urbe condita, from the moment the, the city was uh, built, was created. And uh, he introduced the concept of interregnum, interregnum. Uh, what he told us is that the first king of Rome, Romulus, uh, ruled Rome for 37 years. Now, at that time, 37 years was the average length of human life. People lived not that long as we do. Uh, 37, which means that the moment Romulus died, the most of the people uh, living in Rome never experienced a world which did not contain Romulus. Uh, very much like your uh, younger brothers and sisters cannot imagine the world which didn't contain Facebook. Now, the, uh, the Romans could not imagine a world which didn't contain Romulus. Romulus, the only source, the only known source of everything, of prescription, of command, of advice, of uh, distinction between right and wrong, all laws were coming from the same source. Therefore, when he died, and allegedly, according to legend, he didn't die, but went straight to the heaven. Uh, anyway, when he disappeared from view, there was a panic in Rome, because no one knew what to do. Uh, they were used to receive um, orders of the day from the king of Rome, but he was not there any longer. And so that lasted, that lasted for uh, not a very long time, because a year or so after, the next king, Numa, uh, was appointed, and uh, new souls of authority, uh, reliable, trustworthy souls, was uh, in position. Now, that was the first interregnum uh, known uh, in history with all its consequences. Uh, now, uh, 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 Antonio Gramsci, the great uh, Italian philosopher, dug up this notion from ancient Rome in order to name, by this name, the, uh, well, the uh, time in which he wrote. In this sense, uh, he used to, he was in fact looking retrospectively, a prophesizing person. He actually predicted the coming of the situation which he thought already existing, or at least uh, arising, but we are witnessing today. He redefined, he updated the concept of interregnum. It is not the question of one king replacing another or one uh, party, political party in parliament replacing another. It is much deeper than that. The substance of the spiritual state of interregnum is that the uh, ways of doing things which we deployed so far don't work any longer. They are no longer effective. 
but the new ways, which would be free from this misdemeanor, so to speak, of the old uh, uh, ways of doing things, have not yet been invented. At best, they are somewhere in the, on the drawing board. Perhaps someone somewhere thinks about them, but we are not aware of them. They are not in place, they are not in operation. The old ways don't work, the new ways have not been invented. That is the state of uncertainty in which we are placed today. That's what I'm suggesting you. And uh, as in all uh, uh, states of interregnum, we, we know uh, fairly well if pressed, we could even respond uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a reasonable way what we have left behind, what is not working any longer. But we have no inkling where to we are moving from here. Now, uh, quite a lot of things have changed uh, since uh, I composed this book, Liquid Modernity, which made me to think in terms of interregnum. Uh, this suspension in a void, in a sense. Knowing from where we are coming, but not knowing where to we are going. Um, well, the, when, when I worked on liquid modernity, it was just after, after the collapse of the communist empire, uh, you learned from history, you didn't experience it personally, but there was a period after the Second World War, lasting uh, 40 years or so, when the globe was divided between two world empires, world powers. One was America uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the camp of democracy, the other was the Soviet camp. And, uh, uh, in the 1990s, in 1990s, the dominant opinion was that the competitor disappeared, the uh, way of life uh, represented by the United States and uh, the world uh, allied to it uh, is now the only, the only way of life uh, which will become dominant. The world empire, the world empire. Now, uh, the uh, experiences at the very beginning of 20th century, of 21st century, the uh, um, military expeditions to Iraq and uh, uh, Afghanistan, which brought, in fact, uh, well, the defeat of the war plans undertaken by this only world empire showed a new situation emerging. Uh, there was signal that, signal that, uh, that uh, under present conditions, the one power which rules the global affairs is simply unthinkable. Militarily, there was no question of American superiority. No question of American superiority. The United States of America spent on weapons uh, as much as the 25 uh, states next in hierarchy spent together. There is no other military power which can actually uh, measure its uh, force with the uh, United States of America. Economically, it is not so clear any longer, as you know, uh, because, well, there are China, India, uh, Brazil, um, uh, South, South Africa, uh, ever new centers of uh, economic power are emerging, and America as the last uh, uh, collapse of credit, uh, the catastrophe, financial catastrophe showed, is in a lot of trouble trying to maintain its economic position. But there is still a third element here, it, uh, which was not less visible in previous times. Joseph Nye, Joseph Nye,
I, I suggest to you to read his book uh, about the soft power. He is the person who coined the idea of soft power. There are two kinds of power he gathered from the recent experience. Um, one is hard power, and it is divided into two kinds. One kind is military power, coercion simply by physical force, forcing you to do what you are told to do. And the other is economic power, also hard power, uh, putting you in a condition in which you have to accept <coughs> a rubbish jo rubbishy job, a inferior job you, you wouldn't like to perform, or uh, die in hunger, or be you know uh, kicked out um, <laughs> uh, from a good society and so on. So both kinds operate through coercion. People are forced to do what the forcing power wants them to be done. <coughs> but, says Joseph Nye, uh, the military and economic power is already insufficient in contemporary world in contemporary world to gain domination, to gain a real command over what's going on. Then the third power, which is soft power, which comes to the fore more and more and more. Soft power is not about how many enemies you succeed to kill, but soft power is about how many allies, supporters, companions you are going to gain. It is the reversal of the old logic of the military and economic competition. It is not about killing adversary, but about gaining supporters. <laughs> and uh, Joseph Nye actually draws his conclusions from um, the uh, Iraq and um, Afghanistan escapades, before that still in uh, uh, the war in Vietnam, it shows that uh, 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 it achieved, the United States achieved, well, in some respects, their military purposes. Uh, Saddam Hussein was disposed of in a few days, really, from the point of view of purely military history, uh, it was an exemplary case of successful war planning. So from the point of view of hard uh, power, it gained uh, its purposes uh, quite quickly and efficiently. But on this occasion, it lost a tremendous amount of its soft power because it antagonized the whole Middle East, the whole Islamic world. It actually, uh, uh, the, uh, Saddam Hussein was removed and Taliban's were defeated at the beginning because they were accused of financing Al-Qaeda. But by removing them from power, what uh, the United States caused was creating a huge recruiting ground for Al-Qaeda and transforming uh, international terrorism in a threat which was never before. Roughly this idea. Now, I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that there is more behind what uh, Joseph Nye has said. Um, it, 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 in fact, it, uh, was, it, this, this kind of development was predicted already 1980s by a great uh, French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, I hope you know the name, uh, in his, um, in his uh, uh, study called Distinction. Uh, he suggested that we are moving from the era of normative regulation to the era of seduction. Seduction. And the uh, fight for power will be conducted in, ten, in terms of tempting, seducing, very much like on computer market. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, on uh, consumer market. On consumer market, uh, you create a novelty, you create, say, a, uh, an iPod or iPad with one gadget extra, and then you need to launch a seducing campaign and convince everybody around 
that without this extra gadget, you are good, good for nothing. And uh, you will be really ashamed to show yourself with this old style um, uh, um, uh, mobile telephone in, in, in decent company of friends. So um, uh, this, the, the shift from normative regulation, from imposing certain choices upon people, to uh, relying on temptation and seduction, on PR, public relations, on advertising, and things like that. Joseph Nye suggests, in fact, that uh, what's happening is the acquisition of the same kind of strategy, same, same kind of uh, methodology of acting, so to speak, uh, by the state government that they should behave very much like that. That the major issue for diplomacy, for foreign relations, and so on, is precisely that, how to tempt more and more people to agree on their will, on their will, on their free choice, uh, what you want them to do, to accept it, and to do it. And how to do it at the level of um, state governments, not in the level, at the level of sellers and buyers of consumer goods, uh, by, uh, suggest Joseph Nye, by uh, things like impressive, seductive culture, cultural achievements, uh, pop music, for example, films, which uh, uh, sweep the whole world, uh, actually, uh, America exports 80% of all film, its pro films it product produces. Um, and and uh, in spite of the fact that Bollywood in India uh, is the largest producer of films, uh, what you are uh, normally uh, see when you go to a cinema is an American, American film and not a uh, Hindu film. Uh, Culture is one thing. Attractive culture, which gets many supporters and uh, um, prompts very many people to look up to the United States of America. For example, Joseph Nye is an American politician, American professor of political science, and he has uh, the prospects of America mostly in mind. Um, the second is political values, political values being shown to support the governments which struggle actually to do something good for their citizens instead of uh, um, supporting uh, autocrats, dictators of all sorts simply because they secure quiet you know, law and order and uh, obedience to certain rules set by the uh, dominant uh, country. And, uh, the third element, I don't know why he names it only or the at that point, but the third element is the moral standards represented. Uh, moral authority gained by uh, st sticking to certain moral principles. In other words, military, old-fashioned kind of wars, we are suggested are out of fashion. Um, even, even the clear-cut, the unambiguous dominance, economic dominance of one industrial power or financial power is also out of question. Uh, what uh, Joseph uh, Nye suggests is that uh, it is uh, the countries, it is the uh, forces with the highest soft power will uh, influence the future events. Oh, I signal to you that I'm going uh, one step beyond that, really. I think that uh, the uh, uh, really uh, foundation, foundational ground, foundational level of the present uncertainty, which has become the only uh, uh, certainty of the time, and the present situation in which change 
is the only permanent factor in our lives and derives from different souls. I think that the foundational uh, source of, uh, of this kind of a situation is what I call the a divorce between power and <coughs> politics. Divorce, be divorce between power and politics. Uh, what is power in the last account? What is power? In the last account, power is ability to have things done. I have power means I have the ability to do things. What is politics? Politics is ability to decide which things ought to be done and ability to prevent the other things from being done. That's politics. That's what politics does. Uh, in order to act effectively, you need both politics and power. And until quite recently, certainly when I was your age, it seemed uh, absolutely obvious to everybody around that uh, both power and politics are in the hands of the nation state. Nation state uh, is a household, joint household, of the highest level power and highest level politics. Beyond that, there is a wide west, wide west known to you from westerns, really. Well, a naked force decides about everything, but there is no order. Uh, wild West uh, ranchos were visited by the um, um, traveling judges only once a year or once in just in several years. Daily, it was just the naked uh, coercion, coercive powers to decide about things. But in orderly states, you had power and politics, and that is why the life was normal and, um, and orderly. Uh, it seemed at that time that uh, this marriage between power and politics was made in heaven, and no human uh, power can actually dissolve it. Uh, since then, marriages stopped being so stable as they were then, but also the marriage between uh, uh, power and politics. Power in recent uh, 30, 40, perhaps even 50 years, increasingly evaporated from the level of nation state into the cyberspace. Uh, it now inhabits the area which is free from politics. The international global space is not politically regulated. Why? Because pol political organs, nation states, remain as local as they used to be before. Power is already global, but politics is local. And uh, the hands of the nation states, even very powerful nation states, are not long enough to reach it. We have, on the one hand, therefore, in the world, politic, eh, power which is not under political control, which is virtually free to do whatever it likes. And on the other hand, we have politics which suffers of the deficit of power, not enough power. Not enough power, not enough power to undertake and perform satisfactorily all these functions which modern nation state uh, took upon itself. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the new big question, and that's what changed, that's what that's new element, is no longer what is to be done. Very few people really now are engaged in thinking about the long-term future, the idea of model of society, idea of good society which ought to uh, be substituted for the present, which is not uh, uh, good enough. Uh, but uh, if they don't think about such far-reaching plans, it is because there is the second question, which I think no one can really properly answer. And the second question is, who is going to do it? Who is going to do it? Uh, when I uh, 
again, when I was your age, uh, we all were convinced that in case we finally know what needs to be done, there will be no problem who will do it. Of course the state will do it. State has power in politics, and if we capture the state, the state power, we will introduce whatever we think is the right thing to do. Now, however, uh, very few people will, will look up and, um, and expect uh, states to be able to deliver, to be able to deliver. Po power free from political control versus politics suffering insufficiency of power. And that is the answer uh, to the question where from interregnum comes. It is interregnum between something and between something. What the something which is still ahead is, I cannot tell you uh, uh, in full, uh, with any degree of authority, I'm not a prophet. I studied not uh, art of prophesizing, but sociology. Sociology is not famous for making right predictions. Sociology is very good in explaining everything, but only on condition that it already happened. Uh, uh, if it didn't, then uh, uh, no sociological skill will help you to do it. So I can't tell you about that. But one thing is clear, I think. In spite of, um, that it's not a question of prophecy, it is a question of logic, really. Uh, that uh, in case of such a divorce, where power is global and politics is, uh, is um, uh, local, as before, what needs to be found, in what form, one cannot say. But in some form it needs to be found, and I am making now a prediction, really, that uh, uh, your life will be spent on trying to resolve this issue that will have to be considered and done during your life. What needs to be done? To raise our instrument of collective political action to the level of power. Power is already global. Politics is still local. What we need is again remarry the divorcees. But it can be done only, unfortunately, providing that we are already interconnected, interdependent on the global scale, it can be done only globally. So, uh, we need still to invent global politics, which doesn't exist. Don't mix global politics with uh, international politics. Because international politics, it's a misnomer. There's no such thing that nations uh, share their politics. International politics, in fact, means intergovernmental or even interministerial politics. Some ministers uh, meet, they create ad hoc coalition to resolve a particular problem, and then they wait what, when the real power uh, decide whether they ma made a wrong decision or a good decision. Uh, we have been uh, last year witnesses, all of us, if you watch television news, uh, witnesses of very un uh, encouraging uh, um, uh, things, like uh, Monsieur Sarkozy, Madame Merkel meeting on Friday, uh, deciding what to do about um, Greek or Spanish crisis and then waiting through Saturday and Sunday until on Monday stock exchange is open again and only then they will know whether they made a mistake or a uh, right step. Now under this condition we are really uh, in big uh, trouble when we ask question who is going to do it. Um, we, we have no control, no one has really control on this um, uh, power forces which uh, roam the cyberspace. On the other hand, even the la largest uh, state, most um, resourceful state in the world uh, is not much for those powers. Simply because they are elusive, they are freely moving, they can simply uh, uh, defeat the intentions of the other side by escaping.
by escaping elsewhere where it can't be uh, caught. So the frame in which uh, uh, the liquid modernity operates has changed. It is a different kind of a world. I would say uh, it has been geopolitical watershed, in a sense. It's a differently organized planet. And uh, uh, therefore, underneath the uh, uncertainty and the urge, the, 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 the pressure to change, to be flexible, um, uh, all this which characterizes a liquid modernity is a product, is a rain, not product perhaps, but something, some tendency reinforced uh, uh, by uh, this geopolitical transformation which we are witnessing now. That's uh, one thing I wanted to tell you. Oh. Oh, it's getting uh, late. I, I'll try to cut it down now. All the signal, all the signal, other things have changed in these 15 years. Uh, new, new things emerged, new things emerged, which were not so visible clearly at that time when I was working on the book. First, uh, which I would like to bring to your um, um, Attention is the question of the ongoing diasporization of the planet. We are living more and more in, uh, within the borders which embrace a collection of diasporas, which are becoming more and more numerous. And that's a new situation. It is not a new situation in the sense of migration of great numbers of people because that started with the beginning of modernity and goes on. You cannot have modernity without migration because modern way of life creates a lot of London people and uh, uh, rejects of order building of, or refuse of economic progress and therefore they will be always traveling in search of uh, bread and drinking water. So it's not a new element. There were always um, uh, immigrants and, uh, and emigrees. Uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the exact number uh, about Denmark, but I know that in Europe in totally, uh, in 19th and 20th century, about 60 million people emigrated to the empty lands of um, Canada, uh, United States of America, uh, Latin America, uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand. Um, uh, they were made redundant during the first period of modernization in Europe and they emigrated. And uh, now because everybody is modernizing, because the modernity triumphant around the world, of course there will be migration growing. Now the question is that it creates uh, quite a lot of uh, tensions for reasons which, unfortunately, I don't have time to discuss already because I'm speaking too much already. But, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the new element here is that they cannot be actually stopped. Contrary to what uh, politicians trying to make easy capital or the income of strangers, uh, these strangers support economy of Europe. According to latest demographic prognosis, <coughs> if we don't, Europe does not accept 30 million more immigrants from other continents, then by in a matter of 40 years, the amount of people living in Europe will fall down to 242 million, which, according to economist calculation, won't, won't be enough to sustain our way of life. Which means that our economy needs them. Needs them. In Italy, for example, 11% of the whole GNP, gross national product, is made by immigrants. 11%. Immigrants who are not given citizenship, uh, contrary to the principles of uh, uh, democracy, and not given a right to vote in Italian elections. Uh, they already produce 11%. And try to remove them 
Well, politicians will be uh, probably uh, satisfied that that's an um, occasion to get a few more votes, but the businessmen won't allow it because they need this force. That's, that's people who actually do the services and which produce the things, taking jobs which native people don't, wouldn't, wouldn't like to. At the same time, those new kind of immigrants won't assimilate. The policy of treating the newcomers in the early years of modernity was to assimilate them. They had the duty to become exactly like us. The word assimilation is taken uh, from biology. It is biology building or medicine, but anyway, close to. So you know that originally assimilation means imbibing foreign substances and transforming them into the cells tissues of your own organism, so they become part of you, indistinguishable. And that's why, metaphorically, the idea was taken from biology, language into, into politics, that the newcomers need to as be assimilated, must uh, become identical with ourselves. That was thinkable, this sort of a strategy, at the times when the the dominant idea was that Europe is at the peak, peak of creation. We created the highest culture. Everybody else is somewhere lower down, uh, only climbing to our level. So it is natural only that if someone comes to France or to Germany uh, from uh, Africa or Asia, must immediately forget its origin, abandon his or her identity and become like us. This is no longer on the cards simply because we are living in a multi-centered and multicultural world. No one believes in one evolutionary line of development of culture. Cultures coexist and cooperate with each other and so on and so on. The uh, uh, second point I would like to bring to your attention is and also a new element, it becomes clear and clear that uh, uh, our way of life, consumerism, which we practice daily, and consumerism, not just consumption, but consumerism, consumerism, unlike consumption, is the idea that all social problems, all social conflicts could be resolved by the same answer, raising the level of consumption raising the level of consumption. When George uh, W. Bush wanted Americans to emerge from the shock caused by uh, um, 11th September, by the assault of the Twin Towers, um, and wanted them to return to reality, to daily life, to normality, his phrase was, go back shopping, Americans. <laughs> That is the solution to all troubles and all problems. And, uh, uh, and that puts tremendous burden on consumer society, on consumer uh, economy. Because it is not just about us uh, satisfying our organic needs, but it is about resolving all sorts of problems of society. For example, the problem uh, of the contradiction between your love for your son or daughter, and you want to express the, to, uh, that love, um, by what? By spending a lot of time with your child, by uh, listening very carefully to his or her troubles in school and helping with homework and things like that. But you can't. Why you can't? Because you have to earn money to support your child, children. So you have to follow the professional career. And professional career requires you never to leave your home for a moment without your mobile telephone. So you can be on constant beck and call of your boss. Uh, the, the boundary between uh, uh, work time and leisure time or family time has been effaced. It doesn't exist. Wherever you are on holiday or uh, on a walk with your child or whatever, you are on back on call. So you have moral scruples 
Uh, you have guilty conscience. You did not do your obligation towards the loving ones, or loved ones. Fortunately, you can transform Christmas into a commercial feast. And instead of spending more time with your child, you can bring very, very nice and very expensive presents um, uh, under, under the Christmas tree. That's just one example, but that uh, applies very widely, very widely. The uh, 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 market, not only uh, as mediator in satisfying your uh, organic you know, uh, physical needs or even social needs, whatever, but uh, uh, as a, a producer of what I call moral tranquilizers. Moral tranquilizers, which we need, tremendously need. We all, each one, for one reason or another, because of the clash between values, has some sort of moral problems. And here, what you buy in the shop is not just the commodities, but moral tranquilizers. Every shop, whatever they sell, is a pharmacy with tranquilizers. Uh, and uh, that means, as you know, that you don't feel any longer moral pains, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, um, uh, but it also means that you won't uh, notice in the right time uh, that uh, your ties, your bonds with the near and dear are being weakened and uh, substituted for some sort of formalized ritual, ritual, uh, re, um, <coughs> uh, routinized, routinized patterns. So is our moral, uh, is our consumerist uh, culture sustainable? One thing is that it may be very disruptive and very dangerous but, uh, in uh, prospect for our moral relationship with other people, but the other is very down, downright brutal question, is our planet uh, able, capable of supporting it? According to some compilations, some calculations, it's not like that. It is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a situation in which if the whole planet wanted to follow your Danish or Swedish or French or even British uh, uh, standard of living, we would need five planets instead of one. But uh, as far as I know, there are no four planets waiting in queue to be joined. So the question of sustainability of the planet. Tremendous question, which requires nothing less than rethinking the way of life which we got used to and which we consider the only decent, hospitable for humanity way of life. That's a very big question to which no one has an answer. I recommend to you another book, Tim Jackson's book, Prosperity Without Growth, published uh, two years ago, which uh, contains all these new uh, uh, phenomena which are becoming clear. And uh, one thing which he suggests that uh, uh, if we go on as we are going now without rethinking and reforming, by the end of this century, I quote, <coughs> our children and grandchildren will face a hostile climate, depleted resources, the destruction of habitats, the decimation of species, food scarcities, mass migration, and almost inevitably war. <clears throat> and there he says that our debt-driven and zealously boosted by our powers that be consumption, that this way of life, <coughs> is unsustainable ecologically, problematic socially, <coughs> and unstable economically. Well, another <coughs> author, Jeremy Leggett, uh, makes another alert. He says that 
we have to learn another concept of prosperity, of happiness. Prosperity needs to be thought outside the conventional trappings of affluence. So it can be, it can be some sort of an alternative uh, source of human happiness, which is not measured by the rise in gross national product, which doesn't require further depletions of resources, which is, uh, uh, which is so to speak, environment-friendly and the planet-friendly. Uh, I'm mentioning it simply to show you the grandiosity of the challenges which uh, your generation will be facing. And that's not a prophecy, it is just the mm, description of the fact of the matter. That's actually in which situation we find ourselves. I won't be uh, 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 helping you <laughs> with doing this job because I won't be around for a long time. But, uh, and uh, I won't even uh, manage to write the second volume of Liquid Modernity. So it is up to you to do something about it. Thank you. Mm. Thank you.